Amen. Tonight we're going to be looking at uh, the sh larger catechism question regarding God's punishment of sin. And so it is well that we would begin with strains of though our sins, they are many, his mercy is more. What a glorious, glorious thought there. We welcome you in Jesus' name. Trust you've had a wonderful day in the Lord uh, today. I want to remind you of just a few things that are going on in the life of the church and then have you pray as well. Hope uh, everyone is signed up for the creation camp. Uh, that's scheduled for uh, next Saturday from 9 to 1. Uh, Robert Ross uh, teaches this each year. I think this is his third one coming up and focused on the flood. And uh, look forward to that and look forward to those uh, truths being presented from God's word. And uh, hope that uh, you and your family will come. He aims this to, to really fit everyone from the fourth grade up through adults. And uh, he always makes this very interactive. He said, be prepared to learn, to compete, to fellowship, and to eat. That sounds like a busy time there. Uh, he does need to know you're coming, so let him know, or I'm sure you can let Ruthie in our church office know, and we'd be glad to make preparations for you. Because there'll be food and a t-shirt, Need to know your coming and need to know your t-shirt uh, size as well. Um, please be aware of the churchwide work day coming up on the 13th of May on Saturday. Our deacons have put this together to begin at 8.30 and to run through 12.30 uh, in a campus like ours. We just need time to clean things up and patch things up and uh, make things uh, new again. So please be aware of that on May the 13th. <clears throat> hope that you'll be in prayer for and anticipating and inviting your young friends to be a part of our Vacation Bible School. Vacation Bible School is uh, on June the 19th through the 23rd. And you might say, well, that seems so far away. I can guarantee you for our uh, children's ministry team, they are saying it is right on top of us. And in fact, it is. So we're recruiting those teachers, decorators, uh, food people, craft people, uh, recreation people need all kinds of help, and if you would help us, that would be great, but certainly be in prayer for uh, that time. And then um, any of you who have seniors who are graduating this year, we're looking for pictures so that we can be prepared for uh, that video. Those pictures need to be to Betty Casey by the 1st of May. That would be a huge help to us. Hope that you'll continue to pray for Joy Galloway, who's of course, in the hospital uh, with the uh, cancer and now moved to her liver. She's very uh, sick. As I said this morning, I talked with Tori briefly. Actually, I swapped um, a text uh, with her, and uh, she was saying her mom was sitting up and eating this morning, which was really a very positive uh, thing for her. Then after uh, Sunday school, I got back to my phone. She sent me a text. She said, I looked over there, and my mom had her phone, and she was worshiping with us <laughs> and watching the service on the phone. So we're very grateful for that. Uh, but do pray for her. Um, we'll try to keep you posted uh, as this unfolds. Now, please pray for her. Another very uh, serious and dear prayer request. I know they're all serious and dear. But I hope you'll pray for uh, Carol Ann Fowler. Um, Carol Ann, of course, is Stuart and Dana's 12-year-old uh, daughter, and uh, she is going to have surgery um, this Friday. And you might say, well, lots of kids that age have uh, surgeries. This is for another set of tubes in her ears and for maybe some tonsils and that kind of thing. Um, <clears throat> for someone with Downs, Syndrome. This is particularly difficult to navigate. Uh, Dana said, pain makes her angry. I said, well, that's not unlike some adults I know as well. Uh, but we do want to pray for her, um, particularly this Friday and uh, in the coming weeks. I know um, when Lisa and I were living in the manse here, Janie was 14 and had her tonsils out. And um, it, it's just rough. If you've been through that, particularly as kids get a little older, um, it's not fun when they're a little bitty, but as they get older, that's particularly difficult. So if you'll write Carol Ann, uh, her name on your heart and on your prayer list and be thinking about that, they think they're actually going to keep her overnight, 
just to help with pain control and that kind of thing. So um, if you'll remember Carol Ann Fowler, I know that that would be greatly appreciated. Well, with those announcements made, I want you to turn in your copy of God's Word to Mark chapter 5. Mark chapter 5. As I mentioned before, we're going to focus on uh, the, uh, the punishment of sin. The punishment of sin. And I remember that Chuck Colson years ago, he was known for saying many things, but he would say you can't really get the good news of the gospel until you understand the bad news of our sin. And uh, that's kind of what this message is all about, the bad news. And I think sometimes we minimize the bad news, but as we understand the bad news and all of its gravity, it drives us to the greatness of our Savior. And I was thinking about this, and in Mark chapter 5, beginning of verse 1, is the, the conversion of legion. So I want to read this. This will probably be oh, 19 or 20 verses that I want to read. But it's one of those stunning conversions where you see someone in the worst bondage, in the worst of circumstances, seated and clothed and in their right mind. And that's what Jesus does. He turns lives around. So as we talk about some really bad news uh, in our sermon, uh, please be aware that where our sins, they are many, his mercy is more. Here God call us to worship himself, Mark chapter 5 and verse 1. And then they came to the other side of the sea, to the country of the Gadarenes, and when he had come out of the boat, immediately there met him out of the tombs a man with an unclean spirit who had his dwelling among the tombs. No one could bind him, not even with chains, because he had often been bound with shackles and chains. And the chains had been pulled apart by him and the shackles broken in pieces. Neither could they tame him. And always, night and day, he was in the mountains and in the tombs, crying out and cutting himself with stones. And when he saw Jesus from afar, he ran and worshipped him, and he cried out with a loud voice and said, What have I to do with you, Jesus, Son of the Most High God? I implore you by God that you do not torment me. For he said to him, Come out of the man, unclean spirit. And then he asked him, What is your name? And he asked him, saying, My name is Legion, for we are many. And also he begged him earnestly that he would not send them out of the country. Now a large herd of swine was feeding there near the mountains. So all the demons begged him, saying, Send us to the swine that we may enter them. And at once Jesus gave them permission. Then the unclean spirits went out and entered into the swine. There were about 2,000. And the herd ran violently down the steep place into the sea and drowned in the sea. And those who fed the swine fled, and they told it to the city and in the country. And they went out to see what it was that had happened. And then they came to Jesus, and they saw the one who had been demon-possessed and had the legion sitting and clothed and in his right mind. And they were afraid. And those who saw it told them how it happened to him who had been demon-possessed and about the swine. And then they began to plead with him to depart from their region. And when he got into the boat, he who had been demon-possessed begged him that he might be with him. And however, Jesus did not permit him, but said to him, Go home to your friends and tell them what great things the Lord has done for you and how he has had compassion on you. And he departed and began to proclaim in Decapolis all that Jesus had, been, uh, had done for him. And all marveled. Let's pray together. Father, we marvel. We marvel that you take lives that have been wrecked by Satan wrecked by sin 
knowing that Satan has blinded the minds of them which believe not, people who have cut themselves and been chained, been in bondage to all manner of addiction, and you came and you brought freedom. That's what you do. And Lord, how can we praise you enough? Oh, for a thousand tongues to sing our great Redeemer's praise. We ask for grace that, that you might be exalted even tonight, for you are high and lifted up. The angels fly before your throne right now, crying, Holy, holy, holy is the Lord God Almighty. We praise you. So tonight as we open our mouths in praise, we pray that you would fill them with that which brings pleasure to your heart. We ask this all in Jesus' name. Amen. stand together this evening and sing Jesus I my cross have taken Jesus I my cross Join me as we go before the throne of grace and pray. Father, thank you for the bold access we have before your throne. Thank you for the wonderful promises we have. Thank you for the rescue that you have brought to us through the shed blood of the Lord Jesus Christ. Thank you for Calvary. Thank you for 
uh, the grain of wheat which fell to the ground and died and therefore bore fruit. Thank you. We pray, Lord, in all that has been done for us that we might respond in kind and in that same generosity give ourselves back to you to, to be obedient and to be used in ministry in loving God and our neighbor as ourself. Would you help us to do that? Father, we are compelled to pray. May we not sin against one another and failing to pray for each other. We do pray for Car Carol Ann. We begin now and we pray through next Friday and in the coming days after her surgery, we pray that this would go well, that you'd be pleased to minimize her pain, that you give her grace and just the ability to understand, uh, to trust you, uh, to trust her mom and her dad and that she would find um, encouragement even in the unfamiliarity of a hospital setting and surgery as well. Show your power there. We pray, Father, as well for joy. We pray that you'd comfort her and strengthen her, that you would be pleased to ease her pain, and, uh, Lord, that your mercy would be overwhelmingly shown to her also. Father, I do pray for Robert Ross and the... Uh, creation camp coming up Saturday and pray that that would be of great use to our people. Lord, I know that there is um, a double handful of people who near, need to hear this truth. They need to be driven back to the scriptures and what your word says about the flood and the implications of it uh, for us today. We pray that through a camp like this that we would be uh, encouraged and equipped to stand against the current of era in our uh, culture today. Father, we uh, ask that as we come to this next week that you would do a number of things in our lives. Lord, that you'd stir our hearts for your word, that you'd stir our hearts for obedience to it, that we might have hope in Jesus Christ, that we might be those who would be sharing the gospel, and that we would be those who would be extending the cup of cold water in the name of Jesus Christ. May we do that to your glory. We ask this all in Jesus' matchless name. Amen. Let's stand again and sing uh, for all the saints.
a couple of weeks ago, we were looking at the larger catechism and uh, we were talking about sin and sin's entrance into the world and how it was transferred. And uh, so tonight I want to deal with um, the question, it's actually questions 28 and 29 in the larger catechism of how, um, how the Lord actually punishes sin. Um, I want to read to you question 28 from the larger catechism here. So what what are the punishments of sin in this world? By the way, if God wills, next week we'll deal with the next question, which is how, uh, what the punishments of sin are in the next life. So tonight we'll deal with them in this world. Here's the answer. The punishments of sin in this world are either inward as blindness of mind, a, a, a reprobate sense, strong delusions, hardness of heart, horror of conscience, and vile affections, or outward as the curse of God upon the creatures for our sakes and all other evils that befall us in our bodies, names, estates, relations, and employments together with death itself. So. Uh, Just as a a brief summary there, the punishments of of sin in this world are both inward and outward. They're within the lost person. And essentially, we're talking about what God does in punishing sin uh, in um, that lost person um, tonight. Um, I want to begin by telling a, a, a brief story. There was a man by the name of Edwin Cooper who was famous across America, and yet nobody knew his name, not his real name. Um, and he came from a, a family, and the whole family was a, a family of clowns, literally clowns. And he was a clown, and he began performing before audiences when he was just nine years old. He actually uh, was with the Barnum and Bailey Circus uh, for a while, and then he left Barnum and Bailey, and he became a fixture on TV in the 1950s. And who was he? He was Bozo the Clown. Maybe some of you remember him from uh, back in the day. He entertained both young and old, but he was known for having a message for all of his buddies and partners. Uh, Every week, he'd say, get checked for cancer. Um, As the story is told, though, uh, Bozo, or Edwin Cooper, did not follow his own counsel and actually... Uh, contracted cancer, and uh, it was a situation where it was too late for him when they had discovered it. He was 41 years of age um, uh, when he succumbed to um, cancer. But you know, uh, sin is far more deadly than cancer. Those of you who have battled cancer are going to have a hitch, I'm sure, because cancer is so horrendous. And yet sin is much more deadly. Um, There was a Puritan uh, years ago who said, we we best be about killing sin or sin will be killing us. And that's really uh, the case there. Sin far more deadly and more aggressive and fast growing than cancer. Sin kills and destroys everything that it touches. From the fall in the garden until now, sin takes no prisoners. Um, And this is the purpose behind everything that Satan does. In John chapter 10, verse 10, Jesus said, The thief comes not but to steal and to kill and to destroy. When we regard sin as God does, and that's really our point tonight. When we regard sin as God does, we find nothing humorous or amusing about it. Um, It's not a subject about which we make jokes to tell or to hear as well. Uh, We cannot allow ourselves to be tempted to get just a little closer to sin by making light of it. Um, God hates sin, and he hates it with a holy and a righteous fury, and so should we. When we find ourselves amused by sin... Um, It's time for us to focus on the cross and to see the price paid for us. And that, of course, reminds us that sin is no 
laughing matter. Well, I want to take a, a logical step back, if I could, um, as we're, we're, I want to spend tonight talking about the punishment of sin, but I, we, we left a couple of weeks ago talking about um, sin, its origin, how it was passed on, um, and, and yet there's an intermediate step between that and God's punishment of it, and really, uh, that involves the logical step of the consequences of sin, and I put this down on your sheet. And the consequences of sin are many, but they're summarized under the heading of the depravity of sin. <clears throat> and I want to talk about this just very briefly. I have loaded your sheet with so many scriptures, there's no way we could look at all of them. But I hope that perhaps this week in your uh, uh, times with the Lord that you'll be able to pull these out and actually look at each one of them uh, to the blessing of your soul. We'll look at a few of them uh, to get our bearings. But what is depravity all about? Depravity, total depravity, communicates to us <clears throat> that every aspect of human existence is tainted and polluted by sin. Uh, the, the word total there does not mean we're as bad as we could be. It means that every part of human existence has been touched by sin. Um, I've referenced for you Romans 8, 6 through 8, and I do want to read that passage, but we have looked at the Ephesians passage many times before. Ephesians 2, 1 reminds us that we are dead in our trespasses and sins. But it's Romans 8 I want to look at just for a moment. Romans 8, verses 6 through 8, and, uh, and look at the effect of uh, this depravity upon us. Romans 8, verse 6 says this, For to be carnally minded is death, but to be spiritually minded is life and peace. Because the carnal mind is enmity against God, for it is not subject to the law of God, nor indeed can be. So then those who are in the flesh, the unregenerate, those who are in the flesh cannot please God. Those who are dead in their trespasses and sins, they can't please God. This is why we understand we must be elect if we're to come to faith and repentance. We, we must be chosen before the foundation of the world and, and therefore uh, leading to our regeneration if we are ultimately to be saved. But every aspect of our existence is touched by sin. I've given a short list there below. Our mind is fallen uh, we don't think correctly, and we don't think about the right things. Our wants, our preferences are corrupt as well. Our wills have been warped so that what we want in this life uh, is not according to the will of God. We're talking about the, the lost man, the unregenerate, the unsaved uh, person here. As well, the conscience has uh, been warped as well. The conscience uh, does not... Uh, perform as it should be in the lost man. Oftentimes that conscience is suppressed or it is even uh, hardened there as well. The memory and the imagination has been touched as well and even the body feeling the effects of total depravity um, also. The conclusion there, well the conclusion is is that we are not basically good but we are basically bad. Now I'm not a morbid navel gazer. <laughs> Uh, and and, and uh, reveling in our badness. But again, as Colson said, in order for us to understand the greatness of the gospel, the greatness of the good news, we have to understand the greatness of the bad news and how fallen we are. Oftentimes what we do is we minimize our sinfulness or the effect of sin upon our lives. And therefore, the way that we see Jesus is, is well, I had nearly saved myself anyway. I just needed a little help to get over the hump. And so we have a little sin and therefore a little God, but that's not the case at all. We have a great deal of sin and a gigantic effect of sin upon uh, our existence, meaning we are basically bad. And we need a great Savior because of the size, of the quantity, of uh, the horrible quality of uh, our sinful existence. Well, what's the result of that? What is the result of being in a depraved state? What's the result of being basically bad? 
Well, as I've listed for you there, fallen man has lost fellowship with God. It's sin that has come between he or, or she and God and has separated them. God is a holy being and cannot stand sin, cannot look upon uh, sin. And so it brings about a horrible um, separation there. Um, Romans 3 is such a, a, a wonderful presentation of that. There is none righteous, no, not one. There is none that seeks after God. We're, we're like snakes and under our tongues is, is venom. That, that's our, our nature there. But there are other results as well. We exist under the anger of God. Now this is the lost person. We exist under the anger of God. Do you believe that? I think that there are a lot of people who say, no, I mean, God is basically very happy with uh, the people in this world, whether they're lost or saved. My friends, I want to say very clearly that that is not the case. Now, God, God is not a being who has an unholy bad attitude. He doesn't have a bad attitude. He certainly doesn't have an unholy bad attitude. But he is angry. Um, Romans 1.18, the wrath of God is revealed against all unrighteousness. I want you to look at John 3.36 that I've listed for you there. John 3.36. I often think of John 3.36 in the greater context of John 3.16. We love John 3.16, and we quote it so often, and well, we should. It should be such a great encouragement to us. But in 3.36, we read this. He who believes in the Son has everlasting life, and he who does not believe the Son shall not see life, but the wrath of God abides on him. Are you serious? And the answer is, is Yes. You see, God is displeased with all that the sinner does. And when you're mindful of the fact that the lost person cannot do a good work, there are times that by common grace he somehow does that which is in keeping with uh, the law of God. Even when he does that, that's not something that's pleasing to God because it's not done out of a heart that is oriented towards God. It's not done for God's glory. It's not a good work. I want you to turn to the Psalms because I've got a, a, a short list of Psalms here. Psalm 5 to begin with. And to note, I want to I make this point, if this is not clear to you, that you understand that God is, plea, is displeased. He's displeased with sinners. And he is displeased with all that the sinner does. And it's not kind of displeasure. It's real burning, furious displeasure. Psalm 5, verse 5. The boastful shall not stand in your sight. You hate all the workers of iniquity. Really? There are people, your, many of your friends would say, well, oh, I don't know that God hates anything. Well, what he hates is sin, and he hates a lack of holiness. Turn over to Psalm 7, in verse 11. Psalm 7, verse 11. God is a just judge. We know that. And God is angry with the wicked every day. I mean, that's a lot of constant anger. Angry with the wicked every day. And then one more, and that's Psalm 11, verse 5. Psalm 11, verse 5. The Lord tests the righteous, but the wicked and the ones who love violence, his, that is God's, his soul hates. Now we know God to be a merciful and a gracious God. He is. He is that. And where sin abounds, grace does much more abound. That is the case. But God absolutely hates sin and hates unholiness. And he does not tolerate it, and he does not play with it. He's not Santa Claus who uh, promises coal in the stocking, but somehow never brings it. 
He is a God who, as we're going to say in just a few minutes in the balance of this sermon, is that he punishes sin. He punishes it, the sins of the lost in this life and in the life to come. Um, it's interesting, in Ephesians chapter 2, verses 1 through 3, that, that I quoted briefly a moment ago, um, and you who were dead in trespasses and sins, he's made alive. In that section, in verse 2 and 3, we're called the lost, not we, but the lost are called the children of wrath. Whoa, no, 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 no. I, I'm, not, I'm, not, I'm not in the family of wrath. Oh, yeah. The unconverted being a children of wrath. And why is that? Because that's uh, verse 3 actually says that we're the sons and daughters of disobedience. And God hates that. And his wrath abides. So, a note of encouragement. I put this on your sheet so that if you share this with anybody, you're not going to leave on a down note. You're going to know the way of hope. What is our only hope? Our only hope is to run to Jesus because he's sufficient. Uh, though our sins, they are many, his mercy is more. Uh, where sin abounds, grace does much more abound. Jesus is someone who, who saves us. He's our refuge from uh, not only the penalty of our sin, but, but a refuge from the wrath of God as well. And why is it that Jesus is the one to whom we run? I want you to turn to Galatians chapter 3 here. I know I've got you turning a lot, but I don't apologize for that. I want you to see the truth of God's word. And I want these to be uh, burned into your heart as a, as a blessing and encouragement uh, to you as well. Why Jesus? Why do we run to Jesus? Well, because he's the one who has taken the wrath of God and had it exhausted on him. One of the, I, I, I can't wait, uh, one of the applications I'm going to make tonight is that God is not angry and cannot be angry with us for, uh, as for believers, with believers, uh, because of what he's already done with Jesus. Did you realize that? Let me just say this as an, as an application now. Over the years, I've counseled with people, and they said, well, you know, I committed this heinous sin. I've uh, uh, spoken with uh, a, a, a woman years ago, and she had had an abortion before she had come to faith in Christ. Uh, and many of the rest of us have known horrendous sin. And, and uh, in speaking with her, she was talking about how... Uh, how horrendous this was. She was going through a difficult stretch in her life, and she said, I believe what God is doing is he's punishing me for that sin. I said, oh, wait a minute. You're, you rest in Christ alone for your salvation. You've received and resting in him alone for your salvation as he's offered in the gospel. Well, yeah, I am. I said, do you realize that he, he, that the sin that you're talking about being punished for has already been forgiven and it would actually be unjust if God punished you again for that because he's already been punished for that. His wrath, God's wrath was poured out upon Jesus for your sin. If in fact you've been brought into union with Christ, Christ is yours, your sins are forgiven, removed as far as these. Do you realize that? So tonight, as we're talking about these in this condition, we're talking about the lost. Now, will God chasten us? Yes. Hebrews 12 says he chastens us as a father because he loves us. And the whole chastening that we go through when we are uh, tenacious in our sin and our commitment to it, um, God is the one who comes to us and as a father, he chastens us. Because he does not want sin to reap its horrible harvest in our lives. But we run to Jesus. I, I said I wanted you to turn to Galatians chapter 3. I, I'm uh, segueing there. Why Jesus? Why is Jesus the one we run to? Because Jesus is the one upon whom God's anger has been poured out upon. And he's the one who has removed the curse from us uh, by his work on the cross. Galatians 3 verse 13. Christ has redeemed us from the curse of the law, having become a curse for us. 
For it is written, Cursed is everyone who hangs on a tree. And Jesus did hang on a tree. He hung on the tree of the cross. Verse 14. That the blessing of Abraham might come upon the Gentiles in Christ Jesus, that we might receive the promise of the Spirit through faith. Ultimately, through our conversion, we're saved, where our names are written in the Lamb's book of life, our sins are forgiven, our guilt is removed, we're giving the the gift of God, the Holy Spirit. Okay, so that's kind of an introductory, intermediate step between what we talked about a couple of weeks ago and between the punishment of sin to talk about the consequences of sin. What is that depravity? And these things that we've just unfolded over the last few minutes. So I um, <clears throat> want to start moving towards this punishment. And I uh, want to just remind you, uh, before we actually get into that proper, of what God's anger is. What is God's anger? I've given seven things real quick. I want to just quickly run through them. God's anger is, it's a great and holy displeasure at all sins. I'm not going to look at these scriptures. I'm going to leave them for you to look at at your leisure. A great and holy displeasure at all sin. There's not a sin that is committed where God says, I saw it. He cannot do that. That's what holiness in Almighty God does. He cannot say, that's not a big deal. It's all a big deal. Um, Let me make a comment here at this point about the size of sins. We often talk about, well, uh, there's no sin that's any worse than, than others. There is a sense in which that's true. There's a sense in which that's not true. Um, In other words, all sins are big enough to damn us to hell, right? So even the white lie, even the little, the stuff that's little in your mind. But there is a great variety in heinousness of sin. I'll give you an example, and I bet I can get you to agree with me even if you've not thought about this up till now. People will uh, say what, you know, uh, the Sermon on the Mount says that uh, if you have anger in your heart towards someone, you've, you've committed murder. And uh, you say, well, okay, well, they're, equally, they're, they're equal there. <clears throat> well, let me ask you this. Would you rather somebody uh, call you, you fool or raka, or would you have them rather have them kill you? Well, I think I'd take the, the former. Now, I'm being a little bit funny, but you get the point. Uh, and there certainly are sins that are much more heinous than others as well. God hates them all. Two, number two, uh, God's anger is passionate resistance to every will, every human will, set against his will. His anger means he's resisting that. He does not like that and is fighting any will or intention that is contrary to his. Thirdly, his fierce and judicial attack. His anger is fierce and judicial attack on all resistance and rebellion against him in attitude or in actions. Boy, you read the Deuteronomy 29 passage there and you get a real taste for how uh, fierce God's attack against this rebellion is. Fourthly, it is not an arbitrary thing. God doesn't somehow get angry about uh, uh, this thing and then... A couple of months later, somehow he doesn't get angry about that thing. There's no arbitrariness to it. It's not irrational. It's not impulsive like our anger often is. You know, we're, we're set off. Uh, his anger is always according to his will and to his uh, person. And it's never unjust. God has never exercised uh, uh unjust anger ever. It's always been a righteous anger. Fifthly, God's anger is and remains the most devastating power in the whole universe there. That reference is Nahum. Nahum chapter 1 verses 2 through 6. Do you believe that? That God's anger is and remains the most devastating power in the whole universe. When the Lord Jesus comes back and exercises judgment, Uh, and he separates the sheep from the goats. We're going to see that power. We're going to understand that. 
no more devastating power. The, you know, the movies, the, the movies that are being made now with these incredible, uh, mind-blowing presentations of the power, of, uh, power in the universe and so forth, uh, will be laughable comparing, being compared to the power of Almighty God. Sixthly, this anger is a revealed anger. I briefly referred to Romans 1, 18. The wrath of God is revealed against all unrighteousness. Um, it's seen. God, God is not hiding that. And then seventhly, the aim of God is the total destruction of all that is contrary and opposed to him in his universe. Do you believe that? That's an amazing statement. Um, and I've given you some uh, various references to see your way. Okay, all that's to set us up for God's punishment. And I want to take the next few minutes and talk about um, God's punishment uh, of sin. Now, as I said before, the larger catechism divides these punishments up into punishments that are taking place in this life and then those punishments that will take place in the life to come in hell um, itself. But let's talk about the punishments in this life. Um, and we'll look at some of these uh, passages of Scripture. First of all, and, and this is that list, and I read it in a uh, kind of a clunky way as I read the, uh, the larger catechism tonight. The punishments of sin in this world are either inward or outward. They're either inward in God blinding the mind of unbelievers. I want you to look at Ephesians chapter 4 here. Turn over to Ephesians chapter 4, the blinding of the mind of unbelievers, the punishment of sin that's there. Ephesians 4, verse 17. This I say, therefore, and testify in the Lord, that you should no longer walk as the rest of the Gentiles walk in the futility of their mind. Look at verse 18. Having their understanding darkened, being alienated from the life of God because of the ignorance that is in them, because of the blindness of their heart. God punishing sin in the lost person through the blinding of their mind. He does this as a response to the willful refusal of man to use his mind and his life for the glory of God. The result is, is that in our lost estate, we are naturally inclined to deny those doctrines or those truths which are most important. What do you think the most important doctrines are? Well, the most important doctrines are those that surround the glory of God and those that surround our salvation. We said, nah. And we, we have that rejection and God punishes that by the blinding of God. Minds. There's a second way that he punishes sin, and that is sometimes that he gives the lost over to a reprobate mind. Now, as soon as I use that language, you're thinking Romans chapter 1, and I do want you to turn there, Romans chapter 1. Because he actually says this on three occasions here in Romans chapter 1, giving them over to this reprobate mind. Look at Romans chapter 1, beginning in verse 24. Therefore God also gave them up to uncleanness. And these are these people who just above, um, they, though they knew God, they knew about God, they did not glorify him. I'm looking at verse 21. They didn't glorify him, and nor were they thankful. They became futile in their thoughts, and their foolish hearts were darkened. Professing to be wise, they became fools and changed the glory of of the incorruptible God into an image made like corruptible man, the birds, four-footed animals, and creeping things. Verse 24, And therefore God also gave them up to uncleanness in the lust of their heart to dishonor their bodies among themselves, who exchanged the truth of God for a lie, and who worshiped and served the creature rather than the creator who is blessed forever, amen. But then look at verse 26. For this reason, God gave them up. Here's the second time, this giving up uh, to this reprobate uh, standing here. For this reason, God gave them up to vile passions. For even their women exchanged the natural use for what is against nature. And likewise, also men leaving the natural use 
of the woman burned in their lust for one another, men with men, committing what is shameful and receiving in themselves the penalty of their error which was due. And then one more time here in verse 28. In verse 28, we read, And even as they did not like to retain God in their knowledge, boy, you can imagine that that is the case. Don't even want to think about God. Back to verse 28. God gave them over to a debased mind to do those things which are not fitting, being filled with all unrighteousness. And then we get this long list of sins that are uh, there. What are we talking about there? God gave them over to a reprobate mind. What happens is, is there is a, a leaning on a part of the lost person towards sin in general and to a specific sin. And God in his common grace, grace given to everyone, puts his hand and has restrained that inclination and the actual pursuit of that sin. And as he gives them over, what he does is, is he takes his hand away. And friends, you think about that, and that is a frightening thing. For God to remove his restraining hands there. And this particularly affects the will. So that those who are so inclined, what they do is they say, Well, yeah, let me double down on my sin and pursue it with, with extreme energy and urgency there. There's nothing to restrain the mind. There's no, there's no pang of conscience there that as God removes his restraining hand. There, there's no concern about uh, uh, any illegality, any criminal aspect of this. And nothing restraining the sin and so the pursuit of it to the great destruction of uh, the lost person. Sometimes this results in the Bible calling this a hardness of heart. And we see in the Bible where uh, it'll use descriptors of the lost person's heart as, as being like rock or, or like stone. We talk about the, the regeneration process from Ezekiel 36 where God takes the heart of stone and gives him a heart of flesh. But, but prior to that, that heart is like stone. It's hard. God says, okay, you want that sin? I remove my hand of restraint and allow you to pursue that sin unrestrained. Um, let's look at Isaiah 48. I, this is a, um, a, a passage that is very sobering when it comes to um, sin and the hardness of heart. 48 um, verse... Let's begin at verse 3. <clears throat> We're headed for verse 4, but we'll begin in verse 3. Isaiah 48, 3. I have declared the former things from the beginning. They went forth from my mouth, and I caused them to hear it. Suddenly I did them, and they came to pass. And here we go. Because I knew that you were obstinate, and your neck was as an iron sinew, and your brow bronze. You know what that's like saying? You got a hard head. Your brow was as bronze. It was like you had a brass plate in your head in terms of, of receiving the truth of God. Your head was just hard. You were hard-headed. And that's exactly uh, uh, what we see going on. So how do we see the hardness of heart in of a lost person? Well, when they're not afraid of the threat of God's judgment. Do you see that in the world around you? Oh, my goodness. When people are not afraid of the threat of God's judgment. When they stifle their own conscience. You know, uh, uh, you, you, you think about the impact of a conscience where sin has been committed and committed and committed. And you lie to yourself about that. And you're not honest. And all of a sudden there's, there's this huge callus to where that sin doesn't bother you. Or doesn't bother the lost person that's there. A seared conscience. A seared conscience. You know, you can take a you can take a ribeye and throw it on a really hot fire, and just in a, in a few seconds, just in the fire, you sear the outside of it. 
You sear both sides of it, and, it, and the outside of that steak gets hard. And it actually will seal the steak up, right, to where the juices don't come out of it quite as readily. But imagine doing that to your conscience. And that's what's going on here, the stifling of their own conscience. We see the hardness of the heart of the lost as well when they no longer mourn or repent uh, of sin. Uh, when people make a mockery of their sin or when they want to legalize their sin as well. Okay, so what sins lead to a hard heart? Uh, giving you these uh, four bullets there. Uh, ne neglecting the word or prayer. And I, you might say, well, I thought we were talking about the lost people. And we are. We're talking about lost people. Their exposure to the word and to prayer will help them. Um, as well, keeping company with companions who are empty and who are vain. Keeping company with the wrong kinds of people who will lead you astray. In Proverbs 13, verse 20, I'll read this to you real quickly. He who walks with wise men will be wise, but the companion of fools will be destroyed. That leads to a hardened heart. As well, the shunning of the reproof of sin. We've all dealt with lost people before, and they say, don't stop telling me that. Stop telling, my, my, telling me my sin is wrong or that it's dangerous. Or that it doesn't please God. Stop telling me. I don't want the reproof of sin. And then finally, the committing of sin in a presumptuous sense. Well, how else do we see the punishment of God on, on the inside of lost people? Well, it's blinding. He, God blinds the minds of the unbeliever. Uh, sometimes he gives them over to a reprobate mind. And then thirdly, he gives them over to delusions. Uh, so that they might believe what is false. Now, uh, there's actually a connection between number three and number one. The blinding of the mind often leads to um, certain delusions that are um, there. If you look at 2 Corinthians chapter 4, 2 Corinthians chapter 4, I want you to see this. <clears throat> 2 Corinthians chapter 4 and verse 3 says, But even if our gospel is veiled... It is veiled to those who are perishing. Verse 4, whose minds the God of this age has blinded, who do not believe lest the light of the gospel of the glory of Christ, who is the image of God, should shine on them. Uh, delusions uh, so that they might believe what ultimately is false. And I think this happens where uh, their minds are uh, blinded here according to 2 Corinthians 4.4 4, and that they would believe things that are not true such as you know what I can be saved by my works that's a delusion works will never save us I think I can I think I can work my way to heaven I think there is enough innate goodness in me enough good works there that God's going to say thumbs up you get in and that's not the case but we all know people who believe that. We all know people who believe they're getting to heaven because of their innate goodness or their good works. And that's a delusion. That's a, that's a lie. Fourthly, we see God's punishment in the inner man here by the further hardening of the heart. I've left a letter out in that parenthetic phrase and thus completing, not competing. It says competing. It's thus completing uh, in judgment what the sinner has begun in a rebellion there, a hardening of their heart. Woo! I need to speed up here just a little bit because I do want to get some of these applications. Um, fifthly, uh, by the terrifying of the sinner, thereby driving them to irrationality. Sin will make you crazy. Sin will make the sinner crazy. The best example I know of is, save it, uh, is Saul and David. What should Saul have thought about David? He should have thought, this is, what, this is perhaps my greatest asset in my whole kingdom. I, I want to use him for the glory of God. But what did he do? He thought, oh, he's a threat. Saul has killed his thousands and David his ten thousands. And so what I want to do is I want to kill David. What? What? The irrationality of the conclusions that are being made. Uh, terrifying um, the sinner um, there. 
Uh, let me see if I can uh, explain this just a little bit. Think about the various categories of the punishment of sin that we've already talked about tonight. In, in those categories, the conscience is, we might describe it as a sleep. But imagine the conscience being awakened... And all that awakened conscience can be aware of is the terror of, the, of God in their life. And God punishes sin through uh, that terrorizing uh, the conscience when it's been um, awakened there. Um, those passages that I've referenced for you there in Job, um, God firing arrows into their conscience, um, uh, 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 this fear is spoken of in God terrorizing um, the lost in their conscience. Sixthly, God giving them over to vile affections. That's uh, from Romans 1, verse 26, which we've already looked at. Um, and then we kind of handle the whole, the effects outwardly. Number seven is dealing not inwardly in the inward man, but outwardly in culture. We see this in the various references from Leviticus chapter 26 there. Um, and then the final place we see the punishment of God towards sin is in uh, the bringing of death, spiritual and physical death in general. The wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. Acts 5 is the reference to Ananias and Sapphira that's there. Okay, very quickly some applications to wrap this up. As I go through this, and as I was thinking about this this afternoon, I was thinking, number one, God is restraining a lot of sin in this world. We have no idea. We say, whoa, there's a lot of sin that's going on. We think about uh, what's happening in our, our government, what's happening in our schools, what's happening in our families, and all the, the train wrecks that are there. But my friends, can you imagine how the restraining hand of God is withholding sin? Particularly in our part of the world, that um, the older I get, this is less and less, but sort of a, uh, you, you need to be a good boy and a good girl. Uh, um, the restraining effect of, of a conscience and, and not wanting to disappoint parents and family members. Um, the restraining effect of the law I don't want to get a speeding ticket. Um, I'm, in, I'm inclined to do some criminal activities, but I don't want to be put in jail. I don't want to have to pay a fine. Um, and and, and the, just the restraining work of God in so many different ways. Um, second of all, I want you to be mindful of the fact that we should be amazed. Whenever the lost does something that approaches obedience to God's will or a good work, and we know they can't do what is actually classified as a good work. But we should, we should not be amazed when the lost act like the lost. We should be amazed when the lost somehow mirror a little bit um, somebody walking with Jesus. Oftentimes we say, oh, I can't believe that, you know, this kind of stuff. Well, no, they're being completely consistent with their nature. Um, <clears throat> thirdly, Understanding how lost the lost person is, how sinful the sinful condition is, should make us so happy that God has saved us from this condition. Don't you find it an amazing thing that God has saved us? That he saved any one of us? What an amazing thing. You know, we, we, we sing amazing grace and we think, yeah, wretch, that's all these other people, that's not me. Yes, it is you. I love you, but you're a wretch. And God has saved you. And what an incredible thing, and it should make us so happy, so joyful there. Um, fourthly, the sinner comes to Christ and is saved. And because of the punishment of all sin on the cross, the believer is never punished for Sin, it's already been punished. You have to understand that as a theological fact. I've already mentioned that. I won't spend any time. Fifthly and lastly, should we not seriously pray the Lord's Prayer, lead us not into temptation and deliver us from evil? I know we've been talking about lost people tonight. Uh, <clears throat> but there is a lot of sin out there, and we need to be protected from it. And we ought to be seriously praying, Lord, 
Don't lead me into temptation. Guard me from wandering into sin. And when I finally, when I, I, I get there, I'm, I'm before temptation, I've done all that I can, deliver me from evil. We ought to do that. We ought to pray that in all seriousness for us. Well, God does punish sin. The hope that we have is through the Lord Jesus Christ and his great love. Let me, let's stand. I'm going to pray, and then I'll offer the benediction. We're over a few minutes so I'll close the spirit, uh, this the service, uh, with a closing prayer and the benediction. Father, we thank you for uh, your truth. This is heavy truth. Uh, there's a great deal of uh, of sin around us. Lord, what an understatement! And we really can't imagine how much you're restraining sin. And we pray that you would. We pray that you'd help us to live faithfully in this very fallen world. It makes us long for heaven, but as long as we're here, help us to be those who will be lights in a dark world. That we will be gospel lights in a perverse and lost generation. That's what you tell us in Philippians. Help us to be found faithful and bless your people, strengthen them and protect them. We ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. And go and work out your own salvation in fear and trembling. For it is God who works in you both to will and to do of his good pleasure. And may the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ and the love of God the Father and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with you all, both now and forevermore. Amen. Amen.